You're listening to SM Media, the number one place for exclusive content. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of The Rewind right here on SM Media. I'm Scott McPike, delighted to be your host as always. A star-studded panel for this episode. I'm joined by, first of all, the renowned author of the 50 Greatest <laughs> Rangers games, Martin Ramsey. Martin, it's a pleasure to welcome you on to the show. Thanks for joining me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for asking me, Scott. No worries. Also joined by a man who's featured on the channel before. It's a pleasure to welcome back Stephen Harrigan. Stephen, welcome on. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much for the invite again. No worries. Pleasure. And also joined by Chris Bay of Through the Windows and Heart and Hand. This is Chris, a pleasure to welcome you on the show. Thanks for joining me. A pleasure to be on, Scott. Thanks for asking me. I wouldn't no bother at all. Uh, we're gonna we've chosen this. Well, I've I've chosen this subject of we could have picked kind of more kind of happier Rangers times to to talk about in this show, but it's a that's a subject that's fascinated me for a long, long time. We're going to talk about Paul Le Guin's reign as Rangers manager. Short as it was, it was a full of drama, full of talking points. We are going to get right into it. First time we're going to look at is, I'm going to ask, ask Martin, first of all, Martin, take cash of mine back to the summer of 2006. What were you doing with yourself during that time? <laughs> I'd, I'd finished uni for this the second time um, and, and still tossing up what I actually wanted to do with uh, with my life. So that, that summer was uh, a bit of a lost one, I'm afraid, but an exciting one um, because um, we had moonbeams and, and all of that. And uh, we, uh, as Rangers fans, um, yeah, it was a, a, a new journey. And there, there was something exciting, exciting about that as uh, much uh, as it was a false dawn. So, yeah, um, I was floating about, basically, is probably the best way to describe what I was doing in those six. Brilliant. Stephen, what were you doing yourself in 2006 and why did you think a, why did you think a change was needed after the, the end of the 05 06 season? Well, I mean, police had gone stale. Um, when Alex came in, he did a very good job of taking Advocates players, remoulding them, giving them a bit of confidence boost, and then you know, obviously taking us to titles again. The titles that he won were obviously won in very dramatic circumstances, but they were also won we had the slenderest of margins, and then his magic started to wane. The slate that had really been against him at previous stops at Hibs and then Marwell when he took over Tommy McLean's team was he wasn't very a very good team builder. And we were starting to see the fruits of that. Anytime he was given a wee bit of money to spend, or we know the money wasn't great at this point, he wasn't going out and signing blockbuster deals, but he wasn't spending the money he had in probably the best possible sense. The signings were disappointing, the results were disappointing, and quite frankly, when, when you finish third in a, a two two-legged race up here, it's a bit of a disgrace. No matter how good hearts are, you can never finish third uh, at Rangers and Celtic, especially us. We, we'd really fallen from grace. We knew we were on the, the bit of cutbacks. We were, you know, downsizing, but to finish where we finished, it had the season we had that year. The right was very much on the wall. The Champions League kept him in place for a period longer than he probably deserved. Uh, and any other Rangers manager would probably have been given uh, in these circumstances, but it really just limped on. It needed something. It needed an injection. It needed something fresh. Uh, the support needed, you know, rejuvenated. If you're, if you're looking for a comparison, it was even worse to what's going on across the city right now, where the support base are so, so down. They just feel we needed something to get us going. And that's where we were, um, you know, the last year under McLeish. And it'd been on the cards for a wee while, but especially that last season, it was dire. There's a lot of victories. I wrote, you know, teams like Hibs turn, up, turn us over 3-0 and, and things like that. You just can't survive that in the long run. And it's time it very much came to an end. Yeah, definitely. Chris, what were you doing with yourself in 2006? And what were your hopes going into the when, when Alex McLeish was the announcement came that Alex McLeish was leaving at the end of the season? What was your kind of hopes and expectations? Was there anything you thought could have been in mind for the job? Well, in 2006, I was 16. I was actually about to start my, my hires. Um, and it was my second season having my own season ticket, like the end of McLeish's tenure. And to be honest with you, it was just absolute dire. There was no excitement. Um, there was no buzz. It was actually you would go to the Ibrox full of dread. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I, I certainly was. It was it was pretty much you know Barry Ferguson would get the ball at the halfway line and he'd turn around and give the ball back to Batteros. And mm -hmm. um, there was there was a lack of ideas there. Um, so we absolutely needed a change. Um, I, I don't think there was anyone. Uh, I, I don't think there was like 
a long list of candidates because it was pretty much McLeese was in the job and then it became apparent that Gwen was a target. And it all happened very like suddenly. Like M- McLeish, uh, his departure was announced, and then Le Guin was announced to be the new manager. So there was no sort of kind of rumour mill in terms of who it could have been. It was always going to be Le Guin. Um, and when Le Guin was announced, well, well, actually, before Le Guin was announced, obviously, it was the, the rumour, sorry, the, the anticipation was. Was it fever pitch? Because you were just like, I hope we get this over the line. I hope we get this over the line. And then we finally got it over the line. It was like a new era was about to um, become upon us. And I was, I, I can't describe my excitement because it was probably the most excited I'd been in my Rangers supporting life. Bearing in mind, I was only 16 years old. Yeah. Like, we're getting this top quality continental manager who, let's face it, had a reputation somewhere, if not better than Advocate, um, because we're getting them. Basically, when he's, I think he was 42, 43. Mm. And what he'd done with Leon was just quite outstanding. Yeah, it, the, the domestic, on the domestic front with Leon, he was obviously, um, like three, I think it was three or four in a row he got. But I think it was what he'd done in Europe with him as well, which was all the more impressive. And then, obviously, you see the teams that were looking for Leguin. I think Lazio, they, they tried to get him. Um, another few around Europe. And the fact that we managed to get him, it was a right shot in the arm for Rangers and Scottish football. And, you know, the the... The rumours in the paper and all the kind of tabloid talk was all these exciting players that were going to be joining us and we had all these money, all this money that we're going to spend. And, and Martin mentioned it, you know, he had the, the famous Moonbeams quote by, by David Murray. And I think this is around the time where the, the Ibrox Casino complex and all this kind of stuff. So there was all these exciting things happening. And then as we're about to go into it, the reality didn't quite live up to what the expectation was. See at the time, like when, as you say, we kind of between McLeish and Le Guin, does anybody remember any names like outside of them? The only one I remember was George Burley, but I think that was more when the th- was that more when when McLeish was kind of rumored to be going during the middle of the season. It was the, the typical Scottish football thing of um, if anyone is outperforming one of the old firm, no, they yeah. have to be the next manager. Uh, and it was I mean, they, they had a, an incredible start to that season, if memory serves. Uh, and we didn't, certainly not in, in uh, the, the, the title race. So I think it was that kind of talk. There may have been some uh, something in that. Uh, there may have been some conversations. Um, how do you put this? Uh, we were warned off in terms of any yeah. long, longer uh, term. Uh, uh, longer term suitability in, in a in a job basically, um, and the Champions League is uh, I think like Stevie may mentioned kept the McLeish thing going because yeah. wow we 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 could actually get out of this no one had done it before from from Scotland to get out of this group um, we get out of it in the, just the most shanner way possible man I mean, <laughs> it doesn't matter you're you're still through there but Jesus it's wept uh, I could get football stopped but. There we are. So that, that, that kind of kept it going for, for a bit. Um, but in between that, that, that springtime, or was it March, wasn't it, of, of, of 06? No, yeah. I mean, it was, it was pretty... It was, it pretty was, Aber- it was Aberdeen away as well. It was a kind of yeah. defining result, wasn't it? It was that night. So it's, it's instant, and then you've got this kind of vacuum of, of, of two or three months of a season left where you're, you're thinking about next season. That, that this one's written off. Um and I had, uh, we had a contact close to Murray um, a, a couple of years before uh, and basically, well, this is how he's going to turn that around. We're, we're, instead of the old Rangers model, which was just buy, buy as big as yeah. possible, we're going to buy small and we're going to sell big. Understandably, this is the kind of new European model. Mm-hmm. Um, don't worry, we're, we're getting this this boy boom song in and we'll, we'll, we'll sell him off. I think we maybe expected them to hang around a wee bit more than, you know, four or five months, but right, okay, that's solid information. That's what transpired. Great. And the same source had, had tipped us off about, about Le Guin, but not just that. It was, and here's who we're signing, and here's the kind of money kind of thrown about. Um, and, and Chris mentioned that the, the resonance we had with Cat, I don't think any of us expected it to be the summer of 98 again, but there was that kind of excitement yeah. about... Uh, a kind of continental quality. And Leon in the Champions League quarterfinals four years, uh, three, three years in a row. Yeah. I mean, you can, I know they had a structural advantage in France, just the way that, that the club was set up. So you could maybe negate that. But 
he could coach clearly. He could coach clearly. There was something there. He was wanted by other clubs. I think Benfica with the other the other main one with Lazio. Yeah. Um, taking this year off, so he's quite a, a considered guy, quite a, a, a thinking manager, um, ultra fit. And that was another thing, by the way, that, that I, I can't emphasise enough uh, with the McLeish team. That team was a disgrace uh, in terms of the professionalism, in terms of their attitude, in terms yeah. of how fit they were. Um, which would become apparent very quickly mm-hmm. um, in, in the Le Guin thing. Fans wanted a, a manager with, with a kind of track record in class, right, tick that box. Something a bit different, tick that box because he's continental. But someone that was going to go in and actually work them. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the monster munch thing wasn't known then, it would become known later. But that, that the general feeling was that this squad were not working hard enough. This guy runs marathons, uh, marathons through the desert. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's going to come in and, and do exactly that. So there was, yeah, the, the, it was just a, a big excitement and in terms of who he's going to attract. And that's the big issue. That's the thing as well. I remember I was just turning 10 and it was a World, it was a world Cup year in Germany, if everyone remembers. And there was an ex- France obviously got to the final and there was, I don't know if it was just me being a young 10-year-old, but there was an excitement that maybe two or three of that France, that French team could perhaps be joining Rangers. Like in some, did anybody else have that kind of feeling that like that the World Cup could be a, a kind of avenue for Le Guin to go down for particularly that French team? Does anybody remember thinking about that World Cup in that way? I think it was more pie in the sky, to be honest. Right. Um, I think I think we wanted to believe it, but Aye. we... We sort of quickly realised it wasn't going to happen. I mean, for God's sake, there was there was rumours. I think the, the one of the rumours was Zidane, which was just yeah. ridiculous because obviously he was going to retire. But apparently, Le Guin and Zidane were pals. But one of the other rumours was Sydney Gavou. Um, yeah, I remember that actually. Well, realistically, like, he he wasn't well without a kind of um, stru- financial structure, but we were never going to get players of that quality, um, mm-hmm. and that became apparent very quickly. But that's what we were getting told. Sorry, that's what we were getting told. Not at the World Cup. That, that's that's March, April. Yeah, that this is going to happen. These are the kind of players like from the same sources that had everything right in 2004, whenever that was with um, uh, Boom Song and whatever. Mm-hmm. So you you do buy it. Oh, and also, why would this guy come to Rangers without? That's, that's the yeah. things that fans yeah. always kind of do. They say, well, I mean, managers have incredible egos and never underestimate ever the ego of a football manager who thinks I'll turn this around by my own charisma, my own skills. I don't need a huge budget. I I, I will do this just to, my, my, my management, my methods kind of thing. Um, but I think all fans were kind of joining the dots a wee bit. And obviously we, we, we came to a different picture than, than reality, but it's why would he turn down some of the biggest names in the continent to, to come here um, unless we we're going to throw some, some some money out of it, or he's renowned for for nurturing youth as well. If we can yeah. balance that off with being able to on, on earth a few gems that we can then sell off in you know uh, a year or two. Um, Pre July, we uh, I think a lot of people not quite bought into the level of Zidane's going to come and kick about for uh, a year or two, but the the Guvu certainly he he yeah. was he was coming. That 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 was that. Stephen, see the when does it first can I? What's the kind of expectations? Like obviously, there were players there at Ibrox who would, who would kind of stick on. Who were the players for the kind of old squad of last season that you kind of wanted to stay on and kind of fit this new team that Le Guin was going to build? I think we were looking for... Mark mentioned it there about his policy of bringing new players through. We didn't have a very good track record of that. We tended to bring new players through, then they would stagnate a wee bit and then they would be sold off. The crowd would get into off of their back. And it was a process that was being repeated for a number of years. So one of the things that excited, I think, the whole fan base, and we were all seduced by his name. There's no getting away from it. When he was announced, every single fan was seduced by it. And I think on his part, he was seduced by David Murray. When mm. you look at why he turned down the other clubs, David Murray's a new dealmaker. He, yeah. This has got a wee bit of comparisons for me and the kind of thing that went on with Colin Hendry, where he just wants a name and doesn't do the research. Paul Le Guin probably thought that every club was run like Leon. Now, Leon at that time, a steady club. Yeah. But they're, they're run by the money ball approach that they have yeah. a yeah. structure in place. If you go to Leon, it's a very nice part of France. Football's not 24 <laughs> 7. The players can walk about, it's very relaxed. David Murray's come in. He's obviously had the old private jet out, the wine out. 
he, he's really done all the charm to him and, and sold him this pipe dream of, of what the reality in Glasgow will be like. So it's a bit of boast on both sides, I think he gets there. Paul Le Guin's never used to go for the shopping. You know, he just prepares a meal. He doesn't go and get the ingredients. When he comes to Glasgow, Aye. he's forced to do all that. The yeah. transfer committee that's at Leon would be the one that would be in place <laughs> at Liverpool. You know, that, that's where they take their ideas from. And you see the type of coaches that have come before and after them. It's a, the Perrins or Remy Gardner, even Gerard Tooley's there. Gerard Tooley is more renowned as a, an overseer than he is a football manager. Yeah. Uh, and Leon have a great structure for that. So he comes in here and we're expecting him to revolutionise her, her use team. We're expecting, you know, Murray Park's still there. We want it to be taken from the grass. And the grass of Murray Park's the grass at Ibrox. That's a big thing. We didn't have any expectations. We knew who the stalwarts would be in the squad. But at the same time, I think everybody was quite open. After the season we had, if he decided to clear the lot of that squad out, hmm. there wouldn't have been too many grumbles because you can't sit and argue when you've performed the way that we had the season before. So it was a blank hmm. slate. He had a free reign what to do. We expected more transfers in. We expected bigger names in. When the names started coming out and the names that we were getting linked with started going to other clubs, frustration was growing. The season ticket money was already paid by that point. You were already signed up. Yeah. So you didn't have this kind of medium that we have now to go and vent frustrations. You just wondered if it was agents, if it was paper talk. There was a whole lot of you know narrative going on at the time. So you, you were looking to see what it looked like the part because it, there was still a wee bit of mystique. If you went and brought a player from the French League and he would go and bring a couple of them, partly you still thought, well, he must know what he's talking about. That guy must be one for the future. He's going to turn them in. We're going to change the style that he's going to play. One of the things I was curious about, though, um, in a young player, Charlie Adam was one that had excelled in one previous season for Ross County in St. Mum. He hadn't been given a look in under the cliche. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly he had the opinion that he could go and make an impact under Le Guin. So that had some, obviously been something he, he came up with in conversation with him. So that kind of stuff was interesting. Um, but we, we wanted to see our team become the kind of team we are at the moment where we're, we can compete in continental football. Because we were a joke, we were a joke domestically. Yeah. And OK, you know, we'd been at the Champions League. Leon were going there. Paul Le Guin had been there for two seasons as the Leon coach at quarterfinals. That's the table we wanted to dine at. We wanted to sit there and meet every single season. We wanted that on a consistent basis. We didn't want to be developing our media and things like that, trying to scrape through groups and do that. We thought we could still go there and we still seen the money that was there. Um, so going into that season, it was a huge amount of optimism, but he had a clean slate. He could have done anything for that first six to eight weeks and the fans would have backed him. Yeah. Can well, you well, imagine, Stephen? Sorry, sorry man. Can you imagine that, that conversation with Murray and, and Le Guin? And Le Guin's <laughs> detailing how it works at Leon and, and the kind of uh, intense scouting and, and preparation and Murray just lies back and says, Paul, have you heard of you and Chester? <laughs> That's all you need. Yeah. To, to elaborate on... Sorry, Scott, just, just to elaborate on just ever so slightly about what Stephen was saying there. I disagree slightly about the, the, the clean slate. I think there was four non-negotiables in terms of who couldn't leave. Mm. Uh, it was the four Scottish boys. I think it was Stevie Smith, Alan Norton, Barry Ferguson and Chris Boyd. Yeah. I think those are, the, those are the four that we were we were probably wanting to stay. And if one of those had been sold, we would ask questions. But anyone else was fair game. Um, absolutely. Right, I'm going to come to you, Chris, with the, the signings. Obviously, going back to your, the show you do. Who were the, what were the, yeah. who were the signings that came in that season and what was your thoughts on them, first of all? And we'll go around the table. <laughs> I've got a wee bit to say myself about this, but we'll, we'll go around the table and talk about the signings of that season. Well, the, the, the Le Guin era started uh, with Dean Furman arriving um, and the, the press had made this out to be the South African Frank Lampard, yeah. purely because he was a youth player that played for Chelsea, <laughs> um, which is... But, I, I, again, I, I don't think... But we're not stupid. The Rangers fan base aren't stupid. We we don't... We aren't one for buying those kind of things. But we still... A little bit of us, even the most intelligent ones... Um, I'm looking at you, Martin. I think there's a wee bit of us that will go, oh, there must be something about this boy. Purely based on nothing. Um, yeah. I mean, he's signing for Rangers. He's, he's coming from good stock in Chelsea. Um, but then again, it's still not the first signing we're expecting. The next signing, Leber Sionko, he arrives, he's playing with Czech Republic at um, it was the World Cup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On paper, it's a good sign. Um, there's, I don't think there's anyone complaining. And then it just starts to get a bit bizarre. William Stonji and, and uh, Antoine Ponroy, they arrive from Wren. Um, I think we're still, all the, the fan base collectively are like, right, okay, what's going on here? And then Carl Svensson arrives, uh, captain at IFK Gothenburg. He's in the Swedish squad for the World Cup. Got him for 600,000. You're thinking, this is 
exactly the kind of signing we're expecting. Young talent that's done a wee bit in their career already because they'd won the, the Swedish title with Gothenburg and, as I said, they captained them. So you think there's something about him. Um, and then he takes a, a, a wee dive into the French market. Lionel Letizzi arrives as a goalkeeper. Now, I have to say, Jesus. I spoke to David David Edgar about this, obviously, in my show. We were all under the impression um, that Stefan Kloss was going to be okay for this season. Yeah, he'd had a few injuries, but we didn't actually realise that, as brutal as this is going to sound, that Kloss was finished by then. Yeah. So the smart money would have been to keep Vatarus, which, to be fair to Le Guin, he did try to do. But you've also got the kind of Alan McGregor situation, which I'm sure we'll come to. Um, Jeremy Clement, sought after all summer, um, became a bit of a saga. 1.1 million we eventually got him for, but we had started to try and kind of sign uh, Clermont around uh, the end of May. Um, Leon, it's, it's, I mean, it's difficult to say, well, Leon really playing hardball when you look at the final transfer fee that we eventually got him for, 1.1 million. Is that yeah. really them playing hardball? Just paying them the money if you really want them. And then by far the most bizarre signing of the Liguan era, Mark Turton and Dai. Um, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I have no idea what to say about this guy because he, he played for uh, was it Verdun Sport in the Swiss League. was released. It was part of the, the much lauded Senegal 2002 World Cup squad, but he wasn't one of the, the big stars. But he had done nothing since then. Came on trial to us and he got a deal. Uh, the rumour is that it was a favour to an agent. Um, and then we signed Philip Schiebel, 1.8 million. Um, we chased him for quite a while. Decent track record, um, especially with Bratislava. Had not really his conversion rate with, with Austria Vienna wasn't the greatest, but I think when we talk about the Austria Vienna three, which obviously we'll, we'll conclude with Papic, but when you look at them, they came from a, a championship winning side, so it wasn't all you know what they're signing diddies, but it was very bizarre mm-hmm. the fact that we were raiding this team in three separate occasions. Um, so as I, as I mentioned Papic he, he was the last arrival um, under Le Guin and transfer deadline day uh, 450,000 signed him as a centre half and as we all know what Papic went on to achieve and um, the, the last two the, the Manchester United duo of Lee Martin and Phil Bardsley on loan um, so I have to say you know that's all Le Guin signed and it was underwhelming unexpected and not good enough I remember being very excited about Sionko and Clement. And I remember, obviously, Clement was... Clement, I remember Clement being a bit of a saga as well, but, like, when it, when it gets to the stage... I remember being quite excited about Svensson as well because we'd heard that... Well, obviously, we, we, we all know about how kind of well-respected the Swedes are with, like, defenders and things like that. And But I remember being very excited about those three. I remember... Does anybody remember Lee Martin against Celtic for, the, for my United friendly? Yes, that's why we signed them, I think. <laughs> that was, I remember that. I remember, I was in Channel 5. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember up in Channel 5. We used to have football. But there was a bit of an excitement. Lionel Letizzi was the one that was weird because I remember David told me and told me, and I think he's probably told you as well, that he wasn't the target. Am I? No. No. Does MD want to right. Steve, Steve Mandando. Yeah. Steve Mandanda, that's the one that's the name I heard. Like that's when you go from Steve Mandanda, who at the time would have been maybe 20. Friends yeah. of the 21, you know. To Lionel Letizzi, who we'd obviously seen maybe six years previously against Rangers for PSG in the UEFA Cup. Did they impress anybody then? I must admit, I wasn't too concerned with his signing of Letizzi. He gave me some pedigree. He was at PSG. Yeah. Um, it was the other ones, I mean, the other ones were just a lot of young crap. They seemed as if you were doing favours to agents, and certainly alarm bells were ringing when we took three players from the same club, because Austria Vienna weren't Real Madrid. Um, you know, they weren't turning up, and certainly that's when you really started to think something's a wee bit off here. We know why now, as I mentioned earlier, he's not a person like when they would have went and done the scout himself, so he's heavily relying on the agents at this point. Yeah. We've clearly got a budget that's been set that's not probably what he was envisioned taking over or anywhere near it. So instead of shopping in Harrods, he's gone down to your local quick saves and Aldi's, buying the <laughs> film stuff and relying on a lot of um, hearsay and agent's opinion. And agent's opinion only matters until they get their cut in the pocket and we're laboured with, with people that are on large contracts. And these were a lot of players that you look at the players in isolation, there's not a lot of established names here. Clement turned out to be an okay player. Uh, never had a heart, never had a heart PSG either. 
but he was serviceable, Bill. His problem was they never had the desire to come to your club. They never had the desire to come to the climate. They never had the desire to adapt. Sionko was one of the most laziest players you'll ever likely to feast your eyes on, yet he had ability. That's why he was in the Czech squad. Um, Seaboy was the complete opposite end of it. He had no ability but all the heart. And Papit's only one that kind of rough diamond that you can mould. But it's very odd signs. And, and they've got all the telltale signs of like a a 90s, uh, you know, English Premiership team signing Danish people from all, all the same agent. It's that kind of mold. It's, it's one guy's book opening up and saying, here's my pals, here's what I've got. This is the deal I can do for you. This is your budget. Um, it was very underwhelming. And by the end of the summer, we were really starting to say, well, where's the players? There was, there was a big outcry. Mm-hmm. And when these players come in from Manchester United, um, I think they were probably, again, we, we, we got a wee bit of excitement because Alex Ferguson has talked him up. And Phil Barsley's was on him a very good career, but his career at us was very short-lived, mm. <laughs> being the type of player he turned out to be. You know, he'd been very aggressive in that kind of nature. It didn't really fit in for what like, Gwen wanted. So he never done his homework in any of them. They were all rush deals. You know, you can imagine that the months he spent... If you look at Advocate, for instance, before he came to us, he had six months of detailed planning, looking at everything. He knew exactly when he touched down where he wanted to go. By the time the Gwen came in, the list he had were, they weren't even down to the centre third page, they were down to the back page, and we were scrambling just for numbers. And they players are just making up numbers. That's all they are. There's not a great deal more to a lot of the names that are mentioned in that list. Martin, we'll lead on to the kind of first incident or during the pre season. We'll talk if we thoughts on your sign, the signings as well. But Fernando Rickson, the incident with that, can you remember what happened there? On the plane. Um, yeah, obviously it's the story story emails of of bad behaviour on the, the on a flight. I'm pretty sure. Um, I, I can't remember the the incident itself actually, um, but it was it, it was very Fernando esque, wasn't it? It was um, it was pretty lewd. Um, and here was a I don't know if this split opinion uh, at the time. I I was fine with it. I was fine with him getting carpeted for it because I, I go back to this this thing of the previous season um it's just bad behavior mm. and i'm older than you guys but by the end of walter's time first time in, in the 90s fans are getting sick of this sick of players in victoria sick of um all sorts of um operations being done at the, by the club doctor that, that perhaps weren't family friendly um the, the, the alcohol culture, um, drink driving. I mean, Christ knows how many Rangers players were, were done for drink driving um, during that day. We were winning, obviously, so we, we kind of forgave it, but it, there, there was a sense of... Being a Rangers player is a bit more than than, than just being good on, on, on the pitch. So was, there was there were marks of that again, and here's... Well, Rangers fans love a disciplinarian coach. Doesn't have to be a loud guy, a demonstrative guy like, like, like Advocate was, but just someone saying, yeah, but, but that isn't happening here. And I, I remember being, I'm fine with that because I'll be honest, I'm, I wasn't a huge Rickson fan as a player anyway, even though he, you know, he did that kind of joint um, Player of the Year award um, a few seasons before, or whatever. But uh, no, I, I was, I was happy to see that just instilling some kind of new, new standard. Uh, in terms of the, the, I can only echo the concerns of uh, the boys, to be honest, in terms of the signings. They were not what we were promised yeah. in the spring. And any big, new, shiny managerial appointment that works is usually characterised by big signings early. Mm-hmm. Um, Soonest obviously did it in 86. Um, we watched the 1998 World Cup with Arthur Newman playing, he said, he's coming to Rangers. Mm-hmm. Wasn't he messing about, fanning about for, for months and months, or weeks and weeks it would be, sorry, um, getting some some last minute deals, um, you know, haggling over 10 grand or whatever. These were big and they were statements and they were early and it just didn't happen. Uh, and yeah, echo the points uh, raised by by some of the boys. That mind so much the youth players, because we, we talked about that. Okay, we don't know anything about them, but this guy's got a record but that's fine if it's backed up by some of your what we would call marquee signings and um come on yeah i looked like listen we, we want to see technical players um 
Svensson looked the part, seen the paper when um, he was first signed me this big hairy bastard for for Sweden. So this is a centre half then. Um, You would never in a million years thought that he couldn't actually header a ball. Um, So, but apart from that, nah, you're starting to get nervous. You're starting to get nervous about that pretty early. We'll move on to the start. Sorry, I was just going to say with the the Rickson thing and the aircraft and him being sent home, at the time, I see, remember, I, I was certainly one of the, the people in Martin's camp, and it was a huge, vast majority. I felt the Rangers support were the same. That we felt that was needed. That was a manager saying to stall it early. You know, the, the players that Martin mentioned, they took advantage of McLeish. McLeish had a very easy going nature. He got the best out of them for a period of time. But the feeling was we'd slump because the players basically took the piss. So this was a, a manager coming in, setting the stall out, setting that down early, and sending somebody home. Somebody who had been a player of the year a, a couple of years before, and everybody was behind him. This wasn't a, a thing of, oh, you look back now and say, oh, that's been conceited, started to go wrong. No, it's still the right thing to do. It could not work out in the end, but it, it was certainly the right thing to do then, and it would still be the right thing to do now if it happened. We'll move on to the, the kind of first few games of the Glen Rain. It started with a 2 1 win against Murrow at Firth Park, Lee Boss, Yonko, and Dabo Purcell with the goals. The second game, I'm sure we were all probably at, was the 2 2 draw against Dundee United. 2 0 down, in the, mm-hmm. and then we brought it back to two each. But we're two games in. How did we, Chris, how did we feel? Like, did we feel as if this was a, the kind of beginning of a new era? Like, I remember that 2 that 2 two draw thinking. We looked poor. I remember if Svensson, you, early you, stages of Svensson was just worrying for me, just bad. If you bad. take the two to draw, if you take the two to draw aside, the, the opening game against Mullerwell, um, I had this down for running the treble because we were absolutely sensational that day. Yep. It's the best I'd I mean, seen Rangers play in about 18 months. And I'm not I'm not joking that the football that day was absolutely incredible. But that became an outlier. Um that became very few and far between the league win. Uh, I, I think if we're going to be kind to league win, we have to talk about the performances in Europe, which we may come on to. Yeah, but, we'll touch uh, on that, s- yeah. Especially d- domestically, that that was, that's what, that, he peaked that day and that was the first game. And you, you think about that now, that's incredible because we never re- reached those standards again. Yeah, we got the 1-1 one, one draw with Celtic at Ibrox, but that, that was more luck than anything. I, I don't think we... Could have had too many complaints if, if, if we were on the wrong end uh, of a, a defeat that day. But um, against Motherwell, it was a very, very exciting start. Free flowing football, attacking football. We've seen, um, as, as Stephen mentioned at the start of the show, we've seen this guy that we'd never seen before, but we'd heard all about, Charlie Adam. Mm-hmm. He he was pulling all the strings that day. And then obviously 2 2 against Dundee United. Look, you can look at it from two ways. You can look at the positive and the negative. The negative is like, well, 2 0 down, fucking hell, what's going on here? This isn't, this isn't in the script. Um, but the positive is, look, they had the fight to come back from that. And I wasn't too downhearted. I wasn't too downbeat about it. I thought, do you know what? It could have been a lot worse. We could have been beat. But they've shown fight. They've shown courage. They've shown, they've shown they're, they're playing for the jersey. They're playing for the manager. And, and they got, at least they got something out of it. I mean, one point's better than nothing. So I wasn't too concerned. Um, the, the concerns uh, started to come in in the weeks following the 2 2 draw. But at the start, I was very, very excited. Wait, it, it's it's I know it's an okay couple of games after that. There's the draws against the Fermanagh and Kilmarnock, but there's two defeats in six days against Hibs and eventually Celtic. We'll lead on to the Celtic game in a minute, but is alarm bells ringing at this point, Martin? About what's your kind of thoughts to the first you know six or seven games of the season at this point? It's, it's so up and down. I, I agree with Chris. Actually, the the, the game at Fur Park, the performance at Fur Park, you're like, here we go. Yeah, uh, we've brought in a technical manager. We haven't seen a technically good Rangers team for, for a wee while. That wasn't even McLeish's team. It just kind of cuddled them. Um, this is more like it. We're going to be great. Um, by the Hibs game, you are remembering that you can't do that in Scotland alone. It cannot just be a, a technical approach. And they were powder puff. Um, and that, that, that was the worry. You tried to... It may have been a bit of denial. This is what September, September. Yes. Yeah. Um, you you try and uh, rationalise or say right. Well, we want something different here. We're talking about being better in Europe, just as a as a force in Europe, not just the, the, odd, the odd year. Just being able to play the European game, right? Well, that needs changing up. It might mean that this year 
there's a few casualties because we will we will lack that Scottish game. And this goes back, this goes back to, to, to soon as it's time, really, look, can you be a force in Scottish football consistently as well as being a consistent force in Europe? Not, mm-hmm. um, not taking into account the, the odd run that's based on a bit of luck and a lot of heart and, and desire and whatever else, just consistently good because the two games look like different sports. And that's why we've not been in a national final, an international tournament for, for over 20 years. Um, so this is the conundrum. And I think Rangers or fans were either prepared to say, well, let's see where the year takes us. Uh, it might not be this treble winning um, squish that, that Hugh Keevans of all people had uh, predicted mm-hmm. at the start of the season. Um, because we can't just keep being battles. It doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. work consistently. At some point, we're going to have to have a brand of football and a, an approach that's different, like those foreign guys do, and they seem to be pretty decent at it. Um, but Rangers fans don't have patience, and Rangers fans love, love a team of tackles and um, tough as teak um, players. So that was never, even in theory, that, that was never going to work. But that's, Scott, that, that's the concern. At Easter Road, for sure, um, this is a powder puff team. We're a powder puff defender. Um, Parkhead's going to be brutal. We'll lead on to Parkhead. Obviously, Celtic 2, Rangers now. Gravison gives Celtic lead, and then it's a second goal by a former Ranger, Kenny Muller. Stephen, during that game, I remember there had been a lot of talk during that game about Alan McGregor coming into the team. He was the only player, I think, that it could have been five or six if it wasn't for Alan McGregor that day. Well, I mean, this is... He went down... He got on a chance in the team because Latizzi got injured at the warm-up. Yeah. For a game at Ibrox. Um, there's been a lot of talk Alan McGregor throughout the years. Mm-hmm. The big slight against him, and even by the support at this time, was you have to remember, Alan McGregor's been out on loan at St Johnston, Dunfermline a couple of times. Um, we went out and bought Jesper Christensen because Dick Advocate didn't trust him. Yeah. So, in the support minds, we're still thinking, well, we've not seen enough. He's not the, the presence that he is now. He was still, obviously, in his early career and to mature and he fully, but we knew he had ability. Um, I've been on record before, but I had a friend who played with him um, when he was in his youth and he spoke about him, how good he was. So, I was aware of him, but injuries had really set him back. And I think a lot of supports, we, we didn't know. Goalkeepers didn't come in at a young age and play at Rangers. It wasn't mm. the done thing. You had to go away and then we would buy you back in years to come. So, at the moment, at that, this point in time, we were searching for anything. We had, we had small hopes with Stevie Smith had broken his team and he'd been very positive. Um, and we were looking for these wee fragments, anything that we could take forward. Our big concern in these games wasn't the goalkeeper. It was we had centre-halves that couldn't stop crosses and we couldn't uh, can stop conceding headers. We were powder puff, not just in the middle of the park, but at the back. You look at two games after this and we go away and we beat St Mum 3-2. That game was dire. It was a dreadful day. It was a natural bovo. It was a deflection off his knee. One, of, you know, a natural bovo typical off his knee, shin, and then in at the back of the net from about five yards. But we get absolutely bullied by John Sutton that day. And I, I, I leaving the ground that day, the big chat was Sasa Papic can never play centre half for Rangers mm-hmm. again. We got to that point by October. The fan base were there. You know, Papic would go on and be a stalwart at left back. But at this point, he was ridiculed and rightly so. At centre half, he was getting bullied. He, he came into Scottish football, no idea. He goes up to Inverness and Graham Bain does. Physical strikers were playing against us week mm. in, week out, and that was proving the way to take the game to us. The game at Parkhead, yeah, they, these games go either way. We, we weren't good enough. They absolutely destroyed us. We weren't in that. Yeah. But uh, that game, obviously, Kenny Miller scores, and it's that's kind of the, the story that they kind of take away for the game from that day for a Celtic perspective. But Letizia comes back into the team for the game at home at Inverness, and I honestly, to this day, don't understand that decision. Like, what was what was your thoughts, Chris, when you that result a one 0 defeat at home at Inverness? That should never happen to Rangers Football Club. It should never happen. Is this the one? There's been two one 0 defeats. I, I, can I get mixed up? Is this one Ian Black scored or was it Craig Dargo? No, it was minute? Graham Bain. I think that scored the goal. With this. Oh, was it Graham Bain? I, yeah. I, I knew the. I knew. I, I remember. Sorry that um, Batizzi was at fault. Mm. Uh, well, the, the decision itself, if, if memory serves me correctly, McGregor actually got player of the month, and then he yeah, was that's dropped right. for Batizzi. Yeah. So. As a manager, it's difficult because you've got this guy who you weren't expecting to be so good and McGregor, but you've also got your kind of 
big, big-ish money signing, who is a French internationalist and who you trust in Letizia. Uh I could understand why you done it to a certain degree, but if you are watching players day in, day out, and you also see how players are performing on the park, you should be able to see that Letizia didn't have the the confidence to play um, with the back line. Because I think that was part of Letizia's problem, um, the, who was in front of him. Mm-hmm. And then also the fact that despite that back line being so poor, it didn't overly interfere with McGregor's performances because mm-hmm. he kind of took took up the mantle of actually, as you mentioned, uh, you know, reducing the scoring against Celtic. He, he's the one that he still performed. So you, you have to, for me, it should have stuck with McGregor. And he realised that after the Livorno game, where mm. Letizia had an absolute, it was the worst goalkeeping performance I'd seen from a Rangers goalkeeper ever, if you exclude the, the lower leagues. Um, I, I actually remember Ian McCall in commentary that night saying, I would sub him. And like That's that right. is just unheard of as a Rangers no. fan. So... He eventually did come to his senses, but I can see why he'd done it. You know, um, not that's not to say that I agree with it, but I can see why he put Letizia back in because this is his guy that he's brought over from his country who has a, a decent pedigree, a, a decent track record, as I mentioned, won titles with PSG and um, French, some 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 caps for France, um, more experience. So it, it has to try and make it work. And it's almost an admission of this signing hasn't worked if I go with McGregor. So I can see why you done it, but it was absolutely the wrong decision. And at the time, as a fan, I was I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy at all. We'll move on to the AFA Cup. It was obviously it was probably one of the only positives of that season. But we'll get into, we Rangers beat Mulder to qualify for the group stages, and then become the first European team to win in Italy. I think that's still to this day, apart from Celtic against Lazio. But three two against Livorno away, two 0 against Maccabi Haifa. Two each away to Ops Air and then a 1 0 win against Partizan. Martin, that's a really, really good performance for a European team. Why? What, was it frustrating at the time that Rangers were doing so well in Europe, but could they translate that in, into the league? And did you kind of understand that that, do you think that was a mentality thing, that that was the reason for that? I think it's, just, it's the most interesting aspect of, of this whole debacle mm-hmm. um, that. We get these results uh, for a start and winning in Italy, as you said, that's not something Scottish teams do. Mm-hmm. Um, and people say, well, Livorno, where are they now? They, 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 were, they were there for a reason. You know, mm-hmm. they, they were they winning a, a good place at that time. Um, okay, so we get the results. We played some good stuff. We played stuff that suited what he was trying to do. Ozer, we come back twice mm-hmm. to, to, to grab a point. So you've got what you would call team spirit, resilience, <clears throat> everyone uh, kind of pushing in the, the one direction, which goes against the grain of uh, a dressing room that we were starting to disintegrate and uh, and blah, blah, blah. It's just, uh, I guess, a, a fine example of uh, a manager more comfortable with a particular pace and style of, of challenge. And the frustrating thing was those players responded well for him in, mm-hmm. in, in, in that way. Um, he just, don't forget, by this time he wants out and has wanted out for ages. Yeah. He knew the, the gig was up. He knew this was not going to work out. What the hell am I doing here? Um, uh, he hadn't done his homework in terms of bringing any um, local assistance into the, the kind of coaching um staff and, and, and all that kind of stuff so uh, by now he knows that you know the, the, the writing's kind of on the wall um, but yeah yeah you've got this this group of players seemingly playing for him um, you know rolling the sleeves up when required passing the ball about when required uh, and you're like but you know they're better than St Johnson at home so what's the yeah. you know, what's, what's the crack here um, and well we, we, again it comes back to this real tension that, that maybe only now we, we, are we seeing a Rangers team that is as comfortable with, with, with both challenges. Um, 
whether they can be you know consistently for, for, for years to come it, it remains to be seen but th th that's it in a nutshell this whole season is the, the Rangers challenge in a nutshell to find a team that, that, that can do both and can do both all the time my thinking was as 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 we every every manager that comes and goes with Rangers, it's when my dad says that this isn't going to work that it becomes reality for me. And it came in the eighth of November two thousand and six. First division St Johnson come to Ibrox in the League Cup. Rangers now St Johnson two. It's as poor a performance. It's as poor a. It's just as poor a game as I've ever seen at Ibrox. What was everyone's thoughts about that? Was it? And then obviously the protests kind of start after the game and there's boos and things like that. What does everyone remember about this night? We'll start with Stephen. What was your memories of the that night against St. Johnson? A, a nice night, but the football that we played, the big difference, the reason why we were struggling with this paradox of Europe and domestic life, we were going to be with midfields of like Brahim and Danny, Charlie Adam, Jeremy Clement, and what you get there was a technical ability, but what you actually get there is no pace, uh, no tempo, nothing. And all teams were doing, and all St. Johnson did that night, was really have a wee bit of desire, press us high up the park, get in our faces, get physical. Uh, and it was at this point, we'd seen it so many times, it was just a replication of the league that happened. You know, we dropped nearly dropped points this morning, we dropped points early in the season, Dundee United, we dropped points. They can kind of games, we'd seen it all by now. So there wasn't, we were expecting a wee bit of progress after Europe and things to level out. You were taking Europe saying, okay, that's proof. And that's probably the only difference between the Gwen and a Pedro. In the sense that you knew Le Guin worked at a higher level, you knew he, he had something, especially that time, he had a wee bit of him in the coaching sense, um, but he mailed it in <laughs> and he reserved his best his best tactical plans, everything, he, all his effort went into Europe, while domestically he never got it, he never sussed what teams done, and they didn't do anything different than teams would do now. You have to overcome the challenges, he never done it, and by the time you're not doing it, six, seven, eight, nine times, ten times during the season, and it's the same type of goal and the same type of mistakes came in, came out. The fans had had enough of it, and in that night, uh, it was pretty low. Uh, I mean, the, the goal scorer, your next Rangers player as well, um, it just really it cemented everything. The full circle. There was a young boy that probably should have made it if it wasn't for injuries at Rangers scoring against us, and we had absolutely no supply uh, reply. We deserved that beat. And St. Johnston would go on and obviously get promoted the following season under Derek McInnes and prove they're a decent side, but they had no right to turn up at and winning. Um, but that goes back to what this team were from the very start. So centred. They didn't fancy it. It was a cold, drizzly night. But when the lights shine on in Europe, the cameras on in Europe, they would have the nice passing triangles, get up the park, we'd have that wee bit of fight. But when it came to domestic football, there was too many. Um, they just weren't interested. It didn't matter to them. And that was a problem. That's where the frictions were coming within the squad and the players at this point, because you had players in there that it mattered an awful lot to. Um, but unfortunately, the vast majority it didn't. And, and when you have that fraction in the team, and especially when it's from the head coach who, who doesn't seem to bother too much, he just goes with the, the kind of you know the attitude that that's just a couple. We'll go on to the next one, and um, that bleeds into the, 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 the supporters as well. And by that point, we could all see what was what was coming very shortly. Chris, what was your thoughts of this night? And was this your yeah, kind of alarm bells ringing about? Did you kind of give up on going at this point? No, the alarm bell, the, the sorry, the alarm bells, sorry, the alarm bells. It's easy for me to say. The alarm bells started to ring after this game, um, when Le Guin was sat down with Murray in front of the press. Something that I'd never seen before in my life. Um, that's right, yeah, um, I, that's I, ne I never thought I'd see it, and that's when I knew the time was up uh, for for Le Guin. But the, the match itself, Rangers just didn't get beat off. Low division teams and my Rangers support length team. So this is the first time it happened to me, really. Um, and I was shell shocked. I'll, I'll be honest. I was absolutely shocked to the core. I didn't see it coming when I should have, but I didn't see it coming. The the warning signs were there. Um, the the a performance like this, or a lack of performance like this, was was uh, capable from this team. And um, this team was capable of that. Um, I left the ground that night. I didn't go into the protest, but I did see, obviously, there was crowds gathering. I thought, oh, this could get a bit messy. Were they gathering to protest against Le Guin or the board for the lack of investment? I don't quite know what I was thinking at the time. Um, and to be honest, I don't think the fans who protest, I don't. I think you'll have 50% saying they were protesting against Le Guin and 50% were protesting against Murray. Uh, there wasn't the one focus at that protest, um, it, it was sort of mixed. I think there was a real frustration because we were, we were promised so much. Mm -hmm. And we're now in, what is it, October, November, and, well, the season is in real danger of getting away from us because we're already 10-plus points behind Celtic. We're out of a cup. Yeah, we're doing well in Europe, but 
your bread and butter were, were, were completely failing at that. Um, so came came away that night. I was obviously devastated. I didn't really know what to think. And then, as I say, a couple of days later, Le Guin is sitting down with uh, David Murray beside him at a press conference. And and to be fair, the 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 questions are being answered by Murray, not Le Guin. Mm. This is this isn't this isn't addressed by Murray um, to show solidarity because. From I've done a few shows on the ground with David, uh, David Edgar, and, and basically the, the consensus at the time was Le Guin absolutely wanted out. Martin's correct there. Le Guin was working his ticket, and we'll come to all this with Barry Felix and stuff. But this was a right punch in the ego for David Murray. David Murray was being embarrassed about this whole situation when he fell in love with the idea of Le Guin. Yeah, he fell in love with the idea of a Le Guin team being successful, and the fact that this had come back and slapped him in the face, Murray went into sort of bullish mode and was trying to play the media like he always did. He was trying to pull the wool over the fans' eyes, and he wasn't having this. He he was determined to make this work still, not for Rangers, not for Paul Le Guin, but for David Murray. Yeah, and that's what that show of kind of showmanship was all about that day and that for me was when I was like this is done because the body language of Paul Le Guin at that press conference it was almost one of embarrassment you could tell he didn't want to be there at the time we didn't know it, but when we look back now you can tell he doesn't want to be there you can tell he's mortified that he's got his boss sitting next to him defending him here there and everything and, and Murray instead of actually you know looking at the the reason why this team is performing so poorly, which is mainly down to Le Guin, yeah, the players were underperforming. Murray attacked the players. I mm-hmm. think the quote was, if I remember, the quote was something like, carry on playing like this and you'll be playing for Bristol City in years to come or something like that. He used one of the Bristol teams. And I'm not saying the players were totally blameless, but the fault was far closer to home. And that is that was proven because obviously subsequently Walter came in and he got to tune out these players. So yeah. to me, to me, Murray should have held his hands up and shook hands with Paul Le Guin and said, right, it's not working, go. But Murray doubled down. And that that was the worry. Well, that that was that was a definitely really for, for Paul Le Guin at that point. That's when I knew him myself. Martin Woolley, dog. Well, Chris has made a great point there about David Murray. Let's talk about Murray for a, a couple of minutes. We'll talk about him later on in the episode. But is the story true about Le Guin wanting to leave in September and Murray talking him out of it? Yeah, I think so. I think that's pretty widely accepted now. Um, <clears throat> Le Guin has arrived at a dressing room that's just not professional. And I know Walter gets a, a tune out of them uh, as we we know um but even then he he still had his work cut out with um a few of the instigators of that that that, that culture it is not a proper european football club culture mm-hmm. um he has been given 4 million pounds to change that dressing room that's not enough Walter Smith in the january transfer window to come and the summer transfer window to fall will be given 12 million pounds mm-hmm. He's been let down. He hasn't done his homework, as we, we, we mentioned. Thanks. This clearly isn't going to work, guys. Uh, I'll go now. And to be fair to Le Guin, later, you know, he didn't he, he didn't rip the arse out of the club when it's now kind of the norm in football, isn't it? When managers know that the game's up, well, they fuck go to the chairman and say, um, I'd like to go, please. They'll, they'll continue to say, I can make this work. Mm-hmm. Please sack me. Please sack me. I can, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, Josie Mourinho's making a, a career out of it now. So you, you you have that. Murray has long passed the point um, of just talking the talk. There was a time, and it's almost impossible to even accept this now for, for some fans because we know how the story ended, where he was a dynamic chairman, um, a chairman that was, um, what did I say, loved by the fans, but loved by, by a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, but even... <laughs> Even the, 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 the kind of resident mourners on the, on the old Fall of Fall of fanzine um, up to the mid-90s um, we would still um, be on, on his side on board. Um, but even by the late 90s and, and certainly in the 21st century, talking 
the talk, but but not really backing it up. Um, and it's it's just flim flam. It's just for show. Um, and this is a, a perfect example. Doing the deal to bring him in, as Stevie says, and providing him with n- nothing. To, to really make it work, not ensuring that he's done um, the, his due di- uh, diligence. Just There is a changeover period there. It's not as if this is a quick summer um, snap decision that has to be made. There, there, there's time to to make sure that this guy hits the ground running. Um, and we, we just don't do that. Um, so the St. Johnson game, by the way, uh, I'm old enough to remember just... Uh, Hamilton Aki's coming to Ibrox and, and, and knocking us out the Scottish Cup and you know breaking Chris Woods' his world record um, you know, shutouts and whatever. It happens, it's cup football. The fact that we're miles behind the league, the fact that we 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 talked these games that we talked about, it was clear this was not going to be a happy season. I still would have been in the camp I was talking about earlier. I said, Well, I think there needs to be change in this culture. Mm-hmm how we do football, how we prepare for football, the type of football we play, the type of professionals we have, and professionals in inverted commas, um, I'll, I'll take us another season then. I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll write this off if we can root out some of the problems and, and get going. We didn't know the ins and outs behind the scenes. We, you would expect only a few months in that, that, you would, that a manager probably still wants to be there and does this job, but... Um, as with any football fan, there's a lot of denial about what's staring you right, right in the face. We'll lead on to a week that sums this sums this whole thing up. The the week of Christmas 2006, Rangers go to Inverness the 27th. We go one nil up with a penalty from Nacho Novo, but it is then a 2-1 defeat, Darren Dodds, and then a late goal from John Rankin. I've had the pleasure of speaking to Gavin Ray on this on my podcast about this game, this is the game that he says is when the famous Le Guin and Ferguson incident happens. Now, it's widely believed it also happens in the St Mirren game on the 30th of December with a one-each draw where Rangers go 1-0 down in the 14th minute and bring it back in the 19th minute and there's other 70 minutes with no no heart, nothing really that stuck out to me. The famous thing comes obviously New Year's Day with the the, the talk about Barry Ferguson being stripped of the captaincy. Stephen, what are your memories of those two games and can you explain what happened with Barry Ferguson? Where you, what Your reaction to the news about what happened with Barry Ferguson? I was getting this information at this point in time second hand. I I'd went to Paris for New Year with my girlfriend at the time and this would have been relayed to me, um, you know, what was happening. Uh, and it was expected. Um, the stripping of Barry Ferguson was the final straw because it made made you sure something was going to happen. It was push, come to shove. It was either player or manager. We didn't quite know what would happen next at this current set of circumstances. Hold the supporters of Barry Ferguson because he was the one out in the pitch still giving his absolute all. Whereas Le Guin, he, he was mailing it in for a while. You could sense that. You, you could tell that we spoke about that. Then Vernes came up there was another disgraceful performance. Yeah. Um, you know, the goal that goes in against us from 30 yards. And then, if you, you know, you speak to any players, and they, they'll tell you all, all the kind of stuff that was happening to address him. And it, it wasn't big. It was just, Le like, Guin didn't care. Uh, and when somebody doesn't care, and you do, and you, you're shouting them till you're blue in the face, confrontation's going to happen. So it was at a point of, of no return by this stage. And something had to be done, like, when he made his final stance. He, he's probably up there, in, you know, Inverness in December and all these games, with the weather that we have in Fur Park was pouring down as well. And he's just thinking, I didn't want to be here before. I certainly don't want to be here now. I need to get out of here and get out of here as fast as I can. And if David Murray isn't going to listen to me, because he, he's pleaded with Murray on a number of occasions by this point, then I'm going to force my hand. I'm, I'm going to you know, work my ticket away out of here. There's, there's only one way to go from this point, and, and that's basically what transpired. Ferguson doesn't come out at... Um, Perfectly, uh, you know, he tries to say he's the same. He could have been handled very differently from his point of view, and by some of his fellow teammates as well. Um, but at this point, something has to be done because we are absolutely tearing ourselves apart in front of a live TV audience. You know, Chris Boy's goal celebration, everything that happens after that. Um, that is not the way that Rangers players conduct themselves. It's mm-hmm. not the way they conduct themselves in live TV and in live games. So, uh, yeah, it was that tipping point by this stage. Chris, what was your reaction with the? The news about Barry Ferguson being stripped of the captaincy. Um, well, at the time, obviously, as I explained, I was 16 years old, so I, I don't see it as quite um, 
as, as quite detailed as I, as I do now. Um, I think looking back now, it's pretty obvious what was going on. But at the time, uh, Paul Gwen was the enemy within, to be fair, because Barry Ferguson was my was my hero growing up, and he could do no wrong. Um, and as you said, it happened on New Year's Day. I remember finding out I was on my way to my grand's for dinner, and we, we found out in the car radio, and I was absolutely flabbergasted, to be honest. Um, because Ferguson, for the time that I'd been supporting Rangers, I'd, I'd caught the, the tail end of nine in the row team, but after that, it was obviously the advocate era and McLeish. Ferguson was always, regardless of who was in that Rangers team, Ferguson was always the best player. And he was the captain. And it was the guy that broke my heart and mended my heart by leaving and coming back. And yeah. it, it was, uh, I was just, I, I, as I said, I was, I was stunned. Looking back now, you look at it, <clears throat> Le Guin came out with a comment, the captaincy isn't important in Europe. It doesn't It doesn't regard to the captaincy role as, as, as being as important to European teams as it is to Scottish fans. Bullshit. He knows how important the captaincy role is. He's seen Barry Ferguson as a way of getting out. Now, Stephen makes a very good point. That doesn't mean that Barry Ferguson was an angel because one thing, Barry Ferguson is a lot of things. One thing he isn't is clever. And if Barry Ferguson was clever, he would have kept his fucking head down and he wouldn't have rose to the bait. He would have just took it in the chin and done what his manager was asking him to do. But instead, there was pushback, which obviously created the confrontation, which Barry was wrong in what he'd done. Le Guin was wrong in what he'd done. But Le Guin knew this was his way out because there was no way the support... And, and Le Guin was clever enough to realise this. There was no way the support was going to back Le Guin over Barry. No. Um and David Murray also knew that, so he could see it coming. But I'll tell you who I feel sorry for the most out of all this. It was Gavin Roo. Yeah. He got put into a situation that he should never have been put in. Um, this is a guy that was, you know, a bit part player, a player who was plagued by injuries, um, and he gets frustrated in the ring by giving the captaincy. And th there was, from what I remember, there was some hate towards him because of it. He didn't ask for any of this. Like, it was the Gavin Roo's fault. And another point about Stephen, uh, that Stephen brought up, the, the, the behaviour of Chris Boyd that day was, um, quite frankly, it was disgraceful, um, unprofessional, and it was embarrassing. But I can't be too much of a hypocrite because when I seen it, I cheered. Um, and I, I, I love that kind of shown support to, to Barry. But now as a kind of 31-year-old looking back, it's fucking embarrassing, absolutely mortifying. Martin, what was your reaction with the Barry Ferguson news? And we'll lead on to the, the game against Motherwell. Well, I'll talk to you about the Gavin Ray later on, but what was your reaction to that news? Um, not surprised. There was the, the Christmas night out that the manager had banned um, and they had uh, Ferguson wanted to have anyway. Um, clearly wasn't working um, and it did become, it was bubbling up, wasn't it? This, this kind of manager against captain thing. Uh, we know now, we knew pretty quickly after uh, the event that it, it, it was a, a, a creation um, the, of Le Guin's to, 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 to ensure that Murray took action because there was no way Murray could not mm. not take action now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to say I wasn't as heartbroken as Chris was um, at, at, at the time. Um, the manager's the boss, and that's that. And if but is, is that even Martin? Sorry, is that even a situation like when you're obviously older than me, so you you could see a lot more, and you understood a lot more. But even when you know you you would you must have known yourself what he was doing. Were you still saying well, to yourself? A lot of people so sorry because a lot of people said. He's, you know, he's, he's Rangers through and through and he was getting frustrated and, you know, he's Rangers captain, he stood up and, um, you know, enough was enough. He said that, you know, this was bubbling for, for, for months, you know, um, and that's what a proper Rangers captain does. Well, well, no, a proper Rangers captain in September asked the manager to have a word in private and say, look, I've got concerns about how this is going. I don't think you know Scottish football enough. I've got concerns about how we, we, we shape up in Scotland. Um, how are you thinking about this? Well, what can I do to, to, to help? Because that's what a captain does. Yeah, It's about the team. It's about the club and not about him. Um, 
So that's that was a disappointment. No one comes out of this well, by the way. No. It, it's, it's an utter, utter shambles. Um, and I, yeah, I was one of those supporters that, that bristled um, with the, you know, the Sky were obviously there for the Motherwell or whoever, whoever it was in those days. Um, you know, no Barry, no Rangers kind of thing. I, yeah, I remember that. I cannot, cannot cope with that. No. At all. Um, and it, I, I just, I hated everyone at that point. Um, but it, it, it again symbolised this lack of professionalism. That, that's, not how you, that's not how you manage it. It should have been done earlier. Um, and yeah, and also don't forget, this season Rangers fans are going through a, a bit of an existential crisis as well because th- this has been bubbling up as well, but now really coming to the fore about the songs mm-hmm. and about what what is this club anymore? What's it going to look like if we, we give way on the Billy Boys? Is it, what's going to be next? And um, are we going to have a club left? Or are we going to look anything like the, the club that I've followed for 30 years and my father did and my grandfather did? All this kind of stuff. It's not a happy place in general. Uh, and maybe the Le Guin uh, show and the the, the the kind of superficiality of it all was maybe kind of covering up for, for that. If we, we give it some razzmatazz, people will forget that there's some real questions that the support themselves were wrestling with. I can remember, um, you know, the message boards and, and, and the magazine, it, it, it wasn't clear cut about that. It wasn't quite clear cut about the manager. Um, the first thing I ever wrote about Rangers was off the back of this on, on Follow Follow. Um, and if, if I didn't do that, I'm, I'm not sure I really would be here, to be honest, because it, it, it obviously started something else. But it was, what club do you want? What football do you want? What structure do you want? Who calls the shots? Um, are we professional enough? There was talk of, of Le Guin wanting more training, you know, double sessions, and they were they were resisted. Um, and it, it feeds into, a, 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 again, just a, 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 a kind of deep line feeling that, especially the Scottish players, do not work hard enough. Looks at the time as well. If we didn't get Walter Smith after what happened to Le Guin, there's a real chance that we could have become a club like Chelsea, where it's just run by player power. Because mm. that's what this was. Mm. Uh, and this is the seeds of it being sown. Because Paul Le Guin didn't pick the captain. It was a captain that was already there. It was one that was thrust upon him. And as much as it became a discussion about manager and captain, it was really a personality clash. Paul Le Guin didn't ball it over to Glasgow before you know he took over the job. He didn't do his homework. He didn't form a relationship with Ferguson. And Ferguson, for his part, didn't want any part to play in the open of the professionalism. He was still very much in the boys' club. I've got the best tracky. I run it the way I want to run it. Uh, and that's the way he went on. And yeah, we, we were very close. If Walter Smith doesn't come in after us, there's probably um, a huge question if we go down the abyss and get the kind of player model that Chelsea went yeah. in. Just, just one more thing. I, I've, I've tried to find this uh, article over the years whenever this kind of uh, discussion comes up. Can you find it? But I, I swear it was true. Before the end of that McLeish season, there was a, an article in the BBC, uh, an interview with Ferguson, um, where Ferguson was was not sure if the new manager will want him, not sure yes. if this is going to work. Um, I know what you're talking about, Martin. And I remember thinking, now this is April, whatever, May. That's weird. And <laughs> insecurities about what's coming, I guess. And um, uh, or oh, this guy is a fitness freak and he's a disciplinarian and he's an ultra professional guy what's he going to ask of Boydie and me and Charlie Adam and and, and, and whatever um that I, I struck me as being odd there wasn't much in it it was just a couple of quotes but Ferguson you know it was like I don't know what my future is going to be like again a Rangers captain's like this is good news we look forward to it. a good track record we we're looking forward to you know to the future um a Rangers captain is a statesman, just like the Rangers manager is a statesman. Um, it's bigger than just you and what changes are going to be coming to your professional week. Um, From what I remember, Martin, I, I think it was he personally asked um, David Murray to call Paul Le Guin to ask him if he was going to be part of his plans. Um, and that was, to me as well, even as a 16-year-old, very, very bizarre. It's just, it was, it was, it was bizarre. It was... <laughs> And even if you did, and this is something he's maybe not learned, you keep that in house. Yeah. 
oh, you keep those discussions absolutely. in house and 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 look, Chairman. Is this going to is this guy suit to Scotland? Is this guy going to suit? You know, is he going to like me? Is he still going to you know, be a new manager? Usually, want a new captain and, and you know all, all that kind of stuff. Um, that doesn't need to be in the BBC because it's not about Rangers. We'll go on to the the day after the Motherwell game and where it all kind of goes down. The what I've got here is, and you can you know quote me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Paul Le Guin and David Murray had a meeting. And basically, it was agreed that Paul Le Guin would no longer continue as a ma- as manager of Rangers. Shortly after that, Barry Ferguson had a meeting with David Murray, where he was told, "If you ever do anything like this again, which has since been proven right, yeah. you'd be out the door." This day, that's what's what's the reaction? And with hindsight, are you surprised that this happened? We'll start with Stephen. Not surprised. My reaction was I was flying back at this point. So before I got on a flight, I knew Paul Le Guin was going out. When I arrived back in Glasgow, turned on my phone. My friend uh, informed me that Walter and Ali were coming back in. Picked me up and we went and had a night out in the town um, because we felt we had a club back. Matt, Matt mentioned earlier we were really struggling as a supporters base as a club for our identity at this point. Walter Smith and Ali McCoy gave us a, that back um, because they they were they are our own. And we'd felt that was missing. Barry Ferguson, the support was still split. There's no question at this point. Everybody appreciated Barry as a player, but you could tell yeah. even some of the players in that dressing room at the point, even some of the Scottish players, they didn't like his personality. They probably felt he, he was too overawed in them, uh, you know, perhaps on the verge of bullying. It was his way of the highway. He certainly ran the dressing room. So he was a huge personality. So we were certainly splitting that, but we knew with Walter and Ali coming back in, the track record that they had done in rebuilding in Scotland, we knew we would see, I think we all envisioned we would see a, a lot of the players that, you know, had been rejuvenalised at Scotland come back into our squad. Um, we didn't know quite where it would take us or, or that it would lead us to a European final, but we felt we were going to compete again, especially domestically, because we were miles behind. We weren't even laying a glove on the team across the city, and it, it was just insipid. So for us, it, it was just a huge thing to, to get our club back. Um, it was six months, and it was kind of seen as a six months experiment that didn't work. We didn't know the, the reasons, the reasons we'd all got unfurled in the, the months and years to come. But at that point, um, we still had a plenty of questions, but we were just wanting to move on with the rest of the season and then very quickly get it finished and on to the next one. Martin, do you think it, do you think this kind of example, obviously we touched about Ferguson, but do we think this wasn't helped by how kind of open it was becoming in the press about what was going on behind the scenes? Because I remember at the time my dad making that point that there was a lot of stuff coming out in the press. Obviously Ferguson and certain players would have had their connections with the media and things like that. Do we think this kind of late kind of was a big factor in what happened in this the kind of exit here and how it it's, it's it's dirty running in public, isn't it? And it's, it's never fans fans don't really like that as much. <laughs> this is the contradiction, the hypocrisy. We all want to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, but what we want is a text to us um, and not, not splashed over um, for our rivals to uh, enjoy, uh, I guess. Um, and the relationship with the press is not great as well. Uh, very early on, it was at the Sun that had the you know, chop um, yeah. and just kind of, uh, you know, when's, when's this, this guy going to go and kind of funny foreigner stuff and, and, and all that, that, that kind of garbage. So it, it hardens opinions a wee bit. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it was clearly inevitable. It was no surprise. Um, I felt a bit lost with, from the football perspective, was well, well, that it then? Are we, are we just giving up trying to be a, a kind of modern continental club after six months? Uh, I felt right idea, wrong guy, perhaps. Well, not perhaps, clearly. But we and this is the thing, right? McLeish goes in the end of, of, of 06. If Walter Smith is turning up that summer with Ali McCoyst, who was then kind of known as a captain in a question of sport, mm-hmm. that isn't going down well. No. i tell you that right now. That isn't no going down well. Um, but, you know, six months later, it's um, it's heralded as, uh, as something great. I, I felt it was, at the time, and I can't kid on, I haven't because it's it's out there in print somewhere um, that this was a, a kind of step backwards and what about Europe the big joke being 18 months later we're in, we're in a European final of course I mean, no one saw that coming um, but it was what are we doing <laughs> what, what, but 
you know titles get waved at you and, and you 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 soon kind of um forget about that uh but it was a it was a tense a tense month um january just in terms of where just the general direction of the club and no not not happy with those those players not happy with that squad at all really and yeah those problems would arise again um and you know the, the manager didn't have to to get permission for it i don't think no Chris, what was your thoughts when you heard this news and how did you feel about Walter and Ali coming in and they did really steady the shot that the rest of that season? Yeah, well, first of all, I wasn't surprised in the slightest that Le Guin uh, had left. I think we have to mention a couple of things when it comes to Le Guin. Well, first of all, what Mark mentioned earlier, he didn't take a penny, or if he did, it was very, yeah. very little when he was due. Probably millions because it was a three year contract um, and he wouldn't have been on a pittance, that's for sure. So, um, kudos to Le Guin for that. Did he get his staff then, sorted out, didn't he? No, that's what it was. That's right. Yeah. He, he asked yeah. for his staff to be sorted out and he would take nothing. Yeah. So, uh, really classy gesture um, because, again, as Martin said, managers these days, well, we've got one from Miller City, like Glasgow, that, that done it recently. Mm. Neil Lennon, you know, he, he, he knew it was going to happen and he, he dug his heels in to get his, his payoff. But um, Le Guin didn't. Um, so, so take my hat off to him for that. Second of all, I think, uh, which has also been mentioned by the boys, is Le Guin wasn't promised any of this. And that's not to say Le Guin wasn't to blame for not doing his research, which he should have done. So that's that's his fault. But Le Guin, absolutely, in my mind, and I have no doubt at all about this, he was promised millions he was promised you've got a professional bunch here you're going to get this player that player we're going to do this we're going to do that and none of it came to fruition um none of it it was out his depth in terms of identifying players because he had his obviously he's his, his set up at leon so murray again didn't do his research there do you think, um, do you think though that do you, i'll throw this to everybody sorry to interrupt but do you think paul Le Guin takes that job in the summer if he's told you're getting four million pounds no no is that and you, you'll be you'll be left to, to do everything, or or you and you will be left to do everything. And and uh, have you heard of Austria Vienna? Because uh, you know they, they've got a few. Not not a chance. Oh, and they they don't they weren't finished, Paul. They weren't up the road by twelve. If if, if, if that's all right. Yeah. Paul yeah, for the no old. Chance. See when you were younger and you were talking to a girl in the dancing, uh, and you promised her a lovely steak meal and all that kind of thing. Um, if you got a, a kind of coffee bag at hers. Paul Le fell for that. Once the coffee was served, there's no steak dinner. Um, and he found that, you know, very much after the event. What's the uh, feeling? What's the feeling towards Murray at this point? Does, does anybody remember if, Mor- if is that the first time Murray, David Murray gets the kind of criticism that that soon becomes regular with the range of support from the, then up until he sells the club? Does anybody remember? Murray Murray got away with us purely because of what Walter done. No. Um, for for me. There was criticism of him, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't in the way that he's remembered now. Um, yeah. Right up to the day Murray sold the club, he was still getting away with too much for me. We, us as a club should have scrutinised Murray a lot more than what we did. And and there was those that were scrutinising, there was protests and stuff, but th- there was a real fear of David Murray from the supporters because he instilled that within the, 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 the fan base and fair play to him for doing it. You, know, you, you hear so many stories and none more so better than Murray and me, the, the, the podcast on Heart and Hand by Martin and David. You hear the stories about David Murray and he was a fierce, fierce man. And that came across in, in how us as a, as a fan base responded to his mistakes or his, uh, you know, uh, good decisions. And it was never truly scrutinised the way it should have. A Rangers chairman nowadays would never get away with what Murray got away with. Um, so for me personally... I was pissed off with the whole Le Guin experiment and then David Murray no doing this and no doing that and then the next thing you know you get Walter Smith and Alan McCoy's back to the door and you're just like oh everything in the world's good again and and it was for, for four years um, and then shit at the fan so I would say Murray got away with it at that time uh, Martin or Stephen might have uh, different um, memories but he for did. me he got away with it he, he, yeah he, he did um, because he yeah, go and listen to Murray and me. Um, it's brilliant, mainly for David, not really me. But um, <laughs> the, the the compliance of the media, really, um, they were not going to take him to task. 
Um, and what I could also kind of 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 sell uh, was, look, I tried this for you. Mm -hmm. I, I tried something different. I tried one of the most um, sought after coaches in the continent. I brought them here, uh, and your guys, the Scottish guys, have, have let them down. Um, so what you want is a bit of uh, what we know, and I've, I've I've bought your your godfather back basically, um, and. More importantly, if there was room to scrutinise Murray, anyone had forgotten about it six months later when, as I said, he'd spent £12 million. Mm -hmm. Which for a club that was supposedly on our uppers and try to be smarter in the market and um, you know buy young, buy cheap and, and sell big and just be a lot more intelligent about how we, we do business. We are back to the 90s, baby, and it's just... Two million for this, two million for that, two million for Lee McCulloch, not a fucking problem. Here we go. Um, and fans forget it. They forget it. it, it get Oasis on, get T, uh, TFI Friday on, 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 on the telly before the weekend. It's 1996 again. And that, that's what the, the summer of 2007 um, kind of felt like. So any scrutiny is gone because he's, he, he's paying us off. Well, we know where that led us. Stephen, how will this era be remembered and what is your best and worst memory of the Paul Le Guin era? I think it will be remembered as a failed experiment. Uh, it will be something that no party really wants to revisit. It should have been a whole lot more. Uh, it was our chance of, of going to the... I mean, we should have hired a more smarter manager at that point and we could have been at the continental table. We could have been a, a European club with... Uh, all the kind of tapings that go with it a lot earlier, but we weren't. So it's a failed experiment in that regard. The best points are probably the introduction of young players that I've mentioned, like Alan McGregor, Stephen Smith, Charlie Adam, the likes of they. They're getting first team exposure. Without that first team exposure, then we don't get the benefit of the next season to win the title. Mm -hmm. um, they have to play games, and unfortunately, they have to play tough games to learn what it's about to play at this club. It was a great grounding for them, um, something that couldn't be replicated in any other loan spells. So it was fantastic in that regard. The worst was just, uh, you know, it's difficult to imagine back when I was thinking about it earlier on today. Every game you left home and away, you just kept thinking, we can't head the ball. You know, we ended up playing Brahim and Danny at centre half yeah. in order to try and solve our centre half problems. That's crazy. That tells you where the problems lie. Um, and it's poor from everybody all around. From, from the top, the two people that really should have been, if you look at the top three positions in your club, David Murray, Paul Gwen, and Barry Ferguson at that time, none of them were all in. Everybody was reading off different hymn sheets. Everybody was trying to save themselves. Uh, and it was the fans that suffered. It really is. It's a lost year. Uh, there's nothing more than that. The last six months of it, when Walter comes in, we get a few shoots, obviously. He goes winning at Parkhead. But it's, it's just a write-off. There's not a lot you can take forward from it because we have to start again. Chris, what's your memories of this six months of Rangers history and what was your best and worst memory of the Le Guin era? Quite ironically, the, the best memories are probably before he arrived and after he left. Yeah. So before he arrived, the excitement of getting this sought-after coach and really kind of something which I never thought I'd see uh, after Advocate, especially with the, the financial position the club is in and we were just getting a right top top coach. Or so we were told. Do you know what? I'll, I'll actually, I will actually um, double down on it. I think we were getting a top coach. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever about his coaching ability. But it just was the the wrong movie for him. So to actually get that excitement that summer after having such a a poor season, uh, European football aside, um, that 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 was a really good memory. And obviously after he left, you you, you had the the whole kind of love affair with Sasa Papic um, but that sums up Paul Le Guin there's not much to actually say positively about his actual time at the club yeah we had the European results and stuff domestically I don't think we had anything um, that was to write home about so if I was to give you like one for the actual six months of the year I probably would say the European results um, the worst really is just sort of getting your noses rubbed in it like I think Nine Rangers supporters out of every ten probably were expecting the league title to come back home, and to have it so to have such a disastrous uh, appointment and a disastrous half a season, which ruined everything. Because obviously, by the time Walter arrived, we were out of every trophy apart from the UEFA Cup, but that wasn't realistic. It was just such a a, a kick in the teeth. Um, 
and something of which no one's seen coming because you have to remember as well, Rangers fans at this point, we we didn't see managers coming at the start of the season and leaving halfway through one. That just wasn't a thing. It just didn't happen. And uh, we were always sort of kind of looking at other clubs going, oh, they're a basket case. We had become the basket case. And that that was that that just wasn't Rangers for me. So it was it was very alien to me and it, it wasn't a nice feeling. Martin, what's your overall takeaways from this period of the Le Guin era and your best and worst memory? Um, it was a debacle, obviously. I, I, I guess the biggest takeaway is that this is the nadir of, um, of, of David Murray's reasoning, really. Um, uh, the, the kind of superficiality of his, his chairmanship. Right, Leon are a successful club. Get the manager. The structure that goes with it? Nah. Uh, the culture that that, that that underpins the whole working of the club, nah, 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 nah. We just, I forget the guy there who leads it, that's all I need. And clearly that isn't all you need. Um, and you, you need to, if you want to really take yourself seriously as a kind of modern European football club, it is the structure that has to change. And he he's never really got that way. Advocate, really, it, it took him almost... Um, uh, Fifty cuffs to actually get um, Ock and Howie built, um, so uh, that 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 was it. That 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 that's the takeaway for the whole thing. Um, Le Guin was uh, just the, the tip of that particular um, pyramid at, at, at Leon, and we thought that just taking that gives you the whole thing. Of course, it doesn't. Uh, low lights, Jesus, um, badge thumper. Um, that was a particularly low moment um, at, at Parkhead. Uh, obviously, the way that, that it ended uh, with player revolt, which doesn't, I don't think it sits well with any football fan, doesn't really sit well with Rangers fans. Um, you just, it, if there were issues, they could have been and should have been sorted out with some grown up professional conversations in August and September. Um, so that, that 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 was my kind of light. The highlight as a kid who grew up watching Serie A, um, a Rangers team going going to Italy and 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 winning. Um, don't care about the rain. Don't care about Latisi. Don't care if it was Livorno. Um, Rangers being an Italian team in Europe, um, and it was a a, a wee glimpse of, of I guess what was possible because we we knew or we would know what was possible um, two years later uh, or a year later even. Um, even though I don't think any of us would have expected <laughs> that it was the manager that we chased out the club for being clueless in Europe um, that was going to come back and deliver that. It's a, it's a period of time that, right, as you say, 18 months later, we got a tremendous day in Manchester and it was all down to Walter Smith. So it was a, it was just an, I always, I always have said it was just an, the raw, the, the right guy at the wrong time that, well, the right idea at the wrong time. I yeah, think right. is, aye, I think it's probably the right expression, but it's been a great hour and a half talking about this, and it's been really, really interesting to cover this period that's will, will be fresh in the memories for a lot of Rangers fans. I just want to thank all three of you for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you about this. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Rob. Brilliant. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. We'll see you soon. Cheers. 